My name is Michael Burke, and today is June 27th. I'm interviewing Jane Sherman at the Max M. Fisher Building in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. This interview is being recorded as part of the Women in Leadership Oral History Project. Jane, do you give permission to the Leonard N. Simons Community Archives to publish, duplicate, or otherwise use this recording for educational purposes and for use as deemed appropriate by the archives? Yes. Uh, the Women's Philanthropy Department of the Jewish Federation has had several names throughout its history, including Women's Division and Women's Campaign and Education Department. For the purposes of this interview, the questions will be uh, referred to, uh, the, the department will be referred to by its current name, Women's Philanthropy, but you may call it whatever you want. Um, and as I just said, this is, uh, this is a, uh, this is kind of fun. I know, I'm going to say, <laughs> for when I go back forever. Yeah. Um, when we were 30. And, uh, you know, the, your, your career in, in the community is almost unparalleled. But for the purpose of this interview, we're sort of going to focus on women's department and your involvement with the women's department and how it impacted on you. So, you know, some of these questions may, uh, you know, may be just that kind of focus. So uh, tell me where you were born. I was born in Detroit, Michigan, at yeah. the hospital. And where'd you go to school? Well, that's, that's more complicated. Okay, I, started, well. I started kindergarten in Arizona, then I went to Hampton through seventh grade, and then I went away to school in St. Louis, and I graduated from Clayton High School in St. Louis, Missouri. And then I went on to Connecticut College for Women, got married, came back here, and went to Wayne. Oh, okay. And how was religion observed in your, in your family? There was none. None at all? None at all. None at all. I don't even remember. I mean, Rosh Hashanah, I think Yom Kippur, my father, stayed home from, from work. There was no religion. You know, my mother died when I was 12, and there surely was no religion for my stepmother. Did your, did your mother, um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm uh, going off question just for a second. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, from the time you, she, she died at 12, did she have an interest in philanthropy? Uh, I don't know about philanthropy, but she was very interested in Israel. She was? But yes, that I know. Uh-huh. I mean, philanthropy, you know, who knew from, I didn't know from philanthropy at 12. All right, but take that one step further. How was philanthropy, uh, how was it um, important to, to you or and your family? How to did you? Then or today? No, then. Back then, then, I don't think that it was even an issue. I mean, nobody discussed it. I said, I did this interview the, last week in Israel for Toldot, and he, my first Jewish memory was sitting with my father at the Lee Plaza Hotel, and I think my mother was there too. We had an apartment there, because we were waiting for a house to build in November of 1947. And I remember the radio. I remember exactly where I sat. I re you know, it was one of those old-fashioned radios with the two speakers, you know. Yeah. And I'm listening to the vote for partition at the United Nations. And I remember that thoroughly. Other than that, there is nothing else except when I went away to school, I did insist that I go to, uh, go to um, uh, Jewish, not Jewish, uh, Sunday school, so I could be confirmed, which I was in St. Louis. But there was no, uh, my, oh, there was no religious background. My religious background really came from my girlfriend's parents who had Shabbat on Friday night, and I learned that later in life. What about organizational background? Were there, were, was there any no. of that that streamed through your no, relationships was, back then? No, there was nothing. I mean, I went to temple for Sunday school and confirmation, and other than that, there was no Jewish. Uh, so was women's department your first major uh, foray into? No, I, um, my first major foray was in Florida. When we, we went to, first of all, when we first got married, we were asked to join the young adult division. And then we moved to Florida. And after we were in Florida for nine months, we went to Israel on the second young leadership mission for the United Jewish Appeal. And that's where I really became involved, enamored. I mean, it changed my life. I wanted to make Aliyah. Larry didn't. He had a retail business. He, he, wanted, he didn't think he had anything to offer the country. In 1961, they didn't need retailers. They needed doctors and engineers. That was his excuse. So I came back to Florida, and I got involved in their, I guess it was a women's department, but I helped start what was then the Young Women's Division. 
in Florida, in their federation. And when we came back here three years later, I think it was Shelby Tauber that took me downtown to get involved in women's division here. Was so, Shelby sort of a mentor to you when, when you started um, out? Yeah, she, I mean, she, I, there was, you know, we had lots of role models in those days. Frida Stolman. Yeah, so tell me about them. Tilly Brandwine, Edith Jackier. Um, I remember Frida was the first one to call me for a pledge after the um, Six Day War, and I gave $500. I thought I was giving a billion dollars away. I had told her six months earlier that I couldn't go, $500 was the top level in the women's division then. And I couldn't give the $500. Six months later, we gave it, so I gave it. So your dad was already involved. Yeah, but he never really imposed anything. I mean, he, by then he was chairman of UJA. Um, he had been campaign chairman here, though I wasn't here when he was campaign chairman and president of the Detroit Federation. Um, it really was their, their, their mentorship and role model that got me involved in what was going on. So you were involved in Florida in the Young Adult Division. But young you Women's Division. When you came back here, it, it was really the Women's Division yeah. that you yes, were involved in. Yes, I never went you never back went to, into the Young... Not, I had, no, I never went back to the Young Adult Division here. And were you involved in any other organizations in the community, or was that the first and only at that time? At that time, it was, who had time? You had kids. I mean, it was... And, Enough. yeah, so the, the women's department was the beginning of your involvement in federation and federation C correct. activity. Correct. Who are the leaders beyond the ones you just mentioned? Uh, who, well, do you the remember ones... Who, you remember who the president of the, of the women's department was when you, when you came on board? Do I remember? No. I mean, it's, uh, was it Frida? Could have been Frida. I don't even, I don't remember. Yeah. But, but I know Frida was very involved in Tilly, Shirley Harris, Edith Jack here. They were all Barbara Marcuse. Barbara Marcuse could have been president. She was president before Frida. Uh -huh. I don't know. I can look up on there on the wall and tell you. But I, and Shelby was a... Uh, Shelby, Shelby was, was a, a volunteer. She wasn't, yeah. you know, she was, she was a, uh, you know, she was obviously done more than I did because she's the one that dragged me down there. All right. So when you, when you, when you d made the decision to become involved in the women's department, what, what were the activities that you sort of hooked on to that were of interest? Well, I don't know if you make a decision. You don't, what were they, I, where, where did they lead you? I went into the campaign department. I mean, that was the only thing I was interested in was campaigning. I mean, I, I loved it, as you well, well know. Really? <laughs> really. Um, and I, you know, asking for money from, asking for money was not a tough task for me. I enjoyed it. It wasn't for me. It was for somebody else. Did, um, was there the, the kind of training that you wanted and needed to make you a good fundraiser? In those days, there wasn't any training. I think Ruthie and I started the training program, which was much, much later. There was no, really no training in those days. And, uh, you know, the There was card call. We sat in a room and we'd go over all the women's cards and say, I'll take this one, you take this one. But nobody taught, really taught you what to do as we set up the program years later. And um, was Larry involved at that time? In yes, the, well, he was trying to do a business, but he became involved in the retail division when the, feder the campaign had different divisions. And you know, how much of your time was spent in those early days in the, uh, in the early days? women's philanthropy? Yeah. Well, all my free time that I had. I mean, we were trying to raise three children. It's a, you know, well, that, that's my question. How did your family feel about you? Well, well in those stages, I wasn't running around. It wasn't until the 70s when I became involved nationally that I, it really took a toll on my family. Yeah, so was Larry involved? Did he get involved right away with the shoe uh, the, uh, section? I don't remember. I don't remember. Probably. Yeah. Probably. I worked with Larry. That was, okay. He was one of the okay, first so people that I Okay, so you'll know what with. year it was. Yeah. Um, well, he may he, have been involved much before I came to work here. So. Okay, he, um, I'm sure he did because we were both still so, so in love with Israel and, and, and wanting to give back that, that our involvement. Uh, so, so talk a little bit, you know, the women's uh, philanthropy is always, uh, a touchstone for them has always been educating and training and making them comfortable in doing the kinds of things, including fundraising. What role did you play in educating? Uh, you said that you and Ruth started the well, whole you fundraising. And Ruthie, you, you, Ruthie and I started a leadership, um, what was it called? I guess leadership do, where we taught people how to solicit. 
fact, we took it on the road with us. We did a real training program. I don't think there was anything before that. Um, today, of course, they do it a lot, but this was 40 years ago. Uh, but we wrote the program, we put it together, and we went on the road with it. Were you able to get any of that uh, through to the uh, general campaign and to leadership in the men's? Uh... Not to be until I became campaign chairman, yeah. which was four hundred we'll years later. We'll talk about that in the department. Uh, but I felt that you know I still feel, and I felt at the time that the women educate their families. So it's not a matter of myself being educated. I feel I already was, but it's what we discuss at the dinner table that gets across to your children more so than what the men do. So I feel the fact that women are involved in the community has a much stronger impact on their families. Than I assume the, that's still going on. Well, I would hope so. Yeah. So tell me, uh, uh, tell me about your um, rise within the women's uh, philanthropy. What positions did you hold starting well, from Well, I went all the way from the bottom all the way to the top. I took every position from phone a gift to whatever the next division is, the chairman of what was, was major gifts at the time. I forget, it was a $500 thing. I remember when I was chairman, Vivian Dinitz came to speak. It was at the Renaissance Center downtown um, to campaign chairman, to president. So I went through the whole gamut. I chaired every division um, right through from the bottom. So you said I really went from the bottom right up to the top. So what were your duties as campaign chair? What are the things that you did? Well, I felt very important that I, my women, the women in the leadership, need to be as knowledgeable as I was about Israel. So the first thing I did is that we took the executive committee to Israel on a, on a trip where I felt that they needed the learning experience. How many women went on that? I think 16 or 17. Wow. Um, I felt it was very important that they have the, the and in those days Israel was the number one fundraising tool. And if they didn't understand what was going on, and I think I was campaign chairman in what, 79? 70, because I'd already been involved in the national, national system by then. Um, so I felt very important that I had been to Poland and Romania and Israel two or three times um, and then through the national system. So I felt it was very important that our women have the same knowledge an understanding and feeling for the state of Israel and the problems they had at the time that I did. <coughs> water. I got it. So that was a, that, that was I, I, you know I'm editorializing. I, that was a very important innovation, uh, something that had never occurred before. Were there other innovations in your? Uh, Campaign chairman. Uh, Do you think life? I can remember that? I, can't I think remember. you remember everything. I Jim. cannot remember. I would hope there were, but I really can't remember. Do you remember how much the women's uh, philanthropy raised at oh, that maybe time? Maybe a million dollars. A million? Yeah, probably a million. Yeah. I, Michael, I'm being absolutely honest. That's I okay. cannot That's remember. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so how long were you the chairman of the campaign? I was chairman of the campaign for two years. And then did you go immediately to the presidency? I took the presidency. I did not want to take the presidency. Because? I just wasn't, I, I'm a campaigner. I wanted to be a campaigner. I wasn't, I can't say not interested, but I really didn't want to take the role. I did it for one year. I promised Dulcie Rosenfeld that I would do it for, for one year because we were hiring a new exec and they felt that I should be in that position. Who was Michelle the exec? Michelle Passon. Oh. So um, I took it for one year. Screwed up the whole system. In, in what way? Well, because it was two years, two years, and they oh, I'm saying you, you the, screwed up the whole system. Uh, I, I get what, And I then get. somebody came in to be president that had never been campaign chairman. Not a good thing, probably. Well, I don't know. It worked. It was Ellen Labus, but it, yeah. But um, I think you need the campaign chairman. And were, were there any innovations in your presidency that you're I wasn't there long. I don't know. Particularly proud if there of. were any, I'd like to say where there were a billion, but I don't remember what they are. What role did you play as president in the campaign? In the women's campaign? The women's campaign. Oh, a major role. I mean, I, you have a campaign chairman, but you still play a major role as president. You know, every everything that goes on, the campaign chair, the president's really involved in that and the education department. But you don't take over. Marlene was my followed. Marlene Borman followed after me. And she was campaign chairman, and I, you know, it, 
I didn't want to get in her way. Were there any, uh, you know, you said that uh, the uh, campaign didn't benefit from women's philanthropy until you became the campaign I did chair. not say that. Well, I, I, let me finish the question. So I, I'm saying, what are the things that you think are in your presidency, in your campaign chairmanship, that you were able to impart to the men to make them uh, I don't know if it happened. To be, I don't know if it happened until I became campaign chairman of the well, general, a general campaign. Yeah, that's, that's Well, I would understand the enthusiasm, having meetings. Of course, I had it with David Hermel, and so you know, we it was fun too. But I think that our enthusiasm and our excitement for what went on, teaching them how you know, David and I would go out and solicit people face to face all the time. We tried to instill that upon our weekly meetings with all the other campaigners. And um, so I would hope some of that, that all came obviously from the training I had in the women's department or women's division or whatever it's called today. And I would hope that it instilled in the men. We had a very, very successful campaign when David and I were campaign chairman. Yeah, I know. And, and a lot of fun. I, I know a that lot too. of fun, and it cost us both a fortune because every time you go ask somebody for money for the for the campaign, you got to give back. So, what were the when you were when you were chair of the you and David were chair of the campaign? What was the uh, the mood in the community? What were the challenges that we were facing at that time? Israel related, local. Community? I think it was more still Israel related. It was 1979. No, 19. Oh, it's 89. Russian Jewry was really, David and I took missions to the former Soviet Union. It was before the breakup. We had all these refuseniks coming out, going to La Dispoli. That was a very, very important part of our campaign. And yeah. did the women's department play a, an important role in I would hope that so. whole initiative? I'm sure they did. We were discussing the other night, going to Washington. Oh, we were at a, I was at a meeting and somebody asked, raised, where was I? And, and I was in Israel, and somebody asked everybody in this room that was in Washington for the march in 1986, raise your hand. Oh, it was a Jewish agency dinner. And it was amazing the number of people had been there. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I was there, too. I know. I know. Remember, I lost Larry Jack Year's son. And my I son was there, too. I lost I Seth. There. Well, my kids were there, too, but I lost Seth Jack Year. I, I will never forget it. Um. Did you, do you have anyone that you really underline as being one of your mentors in women's philanthropy, the ones that really taught you? Well, I said that. Frida, Tilly, I think they were two of the most important role models. And what way did they, what way did they serve as a role model and how did they make you a better um, uh, leader in, in terms of being able to move the women's philanthropy. Well, they taught me the forward. first of all. They taught me the importance of women's women's department. I think their demeanor and keeping me calmer. Um, I think their understanding of what went on in the world and, and instilling it upon me uh, and obviously other women, not just me. I think made it. They were a major, major importance to what I did. So you, you know you you took the sixteen women to Israel in your in your uh, your campaign. What, what were some of the other proud accomplishments that you think you had at that time at president campaign chair? How did the how did the whole women's well, philanthropy we a, change in that dynamic of change? I don't Sherman? know if it. I would hope that it became much more exciting in that time. We used to have you know great meetings, a lot of enthusiasm. Um, a, a real understanding and involvement of more people than there had been previously. How did, how did solicitation change from the, the time you started in women's philanthropy to the time that you sort of evolved out of it into the general community? You know, you said that you had meetings and, uh, you know, you called cards, but was there, more personal, was there more, more personal solicitation as you... Yeah, so we, no, it was more personalized solicitation earlier than it was later. I mean, I was still personalized solicitation when I was campaign chairman, and we still called cards at meetings, at the big meetings, et cetera, et cetera. But there was more, it was one-on-one -on -one solicitation. Today, I don't know if there's any, and a lot of it, I don't know if in the women's campaign, but surely in the general campaign is done by 
staff, not lay leader, which I think is a mistake. I think you have to do both. Um, did the activity that the women's philanthropy had in soliciting their prospects in the women's department have impact on the general campaign and the way I, those people were solicited? I don't know about the way they were solicited, but I think that it definitely had an impact on the campaign. In terms of the quality of the gift? I, yes, I would say the quality of the gift, yes. You talked about uh, Michelle Passon being the staff person mm -hmm. that came on board. Talk to me a moment about what you think the relationship is between staff and uh, I think it's a leadership. partnership. I think you know how I feel about this. I think it's a partnership. I think you can't, one can't do the job with it. You have to do it together. If not, it doesn't work. I don't view staff any differently than I do lay leadership. And give me some examples of the partnership that you had. Well, my partnership with you. But that, that was later on. I'm talking about in women's philanthropy, where, well, you, where you work together to, uh, to really... Oh, well, that's a tough question, because I don't remember. Well, so then talk about your partnership with me. Do I have to? No. No, but you and I had a particular relationship. We, we could share everything together, um, and I felt you were... Well, you in many ways were my role model and my mentor. And you did a lot of things to help me, to encourage me. You know who I felt to become about coming general campaign chairman. I didn't want to be the second woman. If I wasn't the first woman, I wasn't interested. And, um, but just your help all the way along the line was very important to what I did in the general campaign, in any campaign. Do you think that you served as a mentor for uh, like a Michelle? And who, uh, in, in the I think so, even though I was only there for a year. Uh -huh. I think so. But you kept you kept the relationship, an ongoing relationship with women's philanthropy, even after after you moved on, didn't you? I mean, there were yeah. there were cards that you solicited. Yeah, you know, I did it for twenty uh, years, yeah, thirty so, years. Yeah. So is that? Did you think that was important? The continuity. Yes. Uh, I think it, I, all the continuity in any any organization is very important. Well, it's interesting. You know, as more and more women became inv involved, and in, as, as they evolved into the general dynamic of federation, uh, there was, this, you know, was there a sense that they, we were losing them in the women's philanthropy because they were going out to other things? I don't think or so. Or were more people like you who... I don't think so. I think we, we were more concerned the women that started in women's philanthropy, we wanted, I mean, in the general campaign, we wanted to get them into women's philanthropy. And did that, ha did that occur? In some cases, in some cases it didn't. Uh -huh. in, um, in, in, in your opinion, you know, the, there's been a, a dynamic change because more and more women today are, you know, are, are professionals and involved in uh, you know, the, the community at large and really involved in other institutions beyond the Federation. What do you think we need to do? What do you think we're doing to keep women involved, not only in the Federation, but in the dynamic of women's philanthropy, which I, th I still think is a very important. Well, I still very think it's important. very important. I think what they're doing, what they've got to do, is has to be for the younger generation. I mean, I think this, the big luncheon they have, the women's philanthropy, I don't even remember what's called, my, oh, the signature event. I think it's a very important event. I don't know if it's a fundraising event, but it is a very important event to, to show one of the biggest complaints, and you know this as well as I do, among men or women, is that Federation only calls for money. The only call I get is, and I think, I hope it's evolved over the years that we provide much more than picking up the phone with money. And I think that we've done that. I think, in fact, Miriam probably did it better than anybody. When Miriam Rosenzweig came in here and started the, worked with the young adults or whatever they call it today, and started all these programs where they'd come and they weren't asking for money, and then they got them involved. I think that's the most important, and particularly with this generation. I think it's much, much harder today to raise money among the younger generation than it was to do it um, um, with our generation. First of all, you had a state of Israel that was, was going to war or having wars. You had the Russian immigration. You had the Ethiopian immigration. Things to tie to. Today, the younger generation doesn't have these issues, so it's very difficult. So we have to bring them in with an understanding that they have a sense of, to explain to them a sense of community, which again is a problem. To, to the, you know, Beck, you, you just named a, a lot of things that were there for us 
uh, that we could build a campaign on. Uh, did, the, did the women play an important part in uh, moving those agendas and those initiatives forward back, back then, Jane? No, no, I think they were there. I don't know if they played an important part. Uh, you, were they part of the... Um, no. Okay. I was just going to say, were, was it part of the, um, the dialogue that was held in women's department to help them raise money? Oh, yes, it was part of the dialogue. But were they part of making the decisions? I don't think so. And, um, and what about now? I would hope. Well, you've got a woman president. You've had two women presidents. Lots of women campaign chairman. I would hope they'd have part in the dialogue. I mean, I'm even talking about women's philanthropy having a, a role in the dynamic uh, of the Federation. It's really hard for me to say because I'm too far away from it. Mm -hmm. What would you suspect? I would hope so. I'm not going to say suspect anything. So you know, it says here what you know. Who were the who were the staff people in women's family besides Michelle that you worked with? Um, and what Barbara Satinsky. Satinsky. Satinsky, and oh, what's her name before Barbara? When she died, short. Uh, we we're going to say Frida, wasn't it? Bertha Chomsky. Bertha Chomsky. Did you work with Lois? Yes, I worked with Lois, Lois Brown. Yeah, she was unique because she was a lay leader before yeah, she was a... Yeah. So, well, I became a professional, too, as a lay leader, too. You, you still are. Yeah. Um, and how yeah. were you affected by transition from one staff person to the other? Uh, well, and what did you feel was your role and responsibility when one staff person left and a new person Well, I think you out. have to be able to be there to mentor them and help them what's going on. And obviously, somebody like Michelle who came in out of the blue, and she had to learn what was going on and begin to understand what was happening in the women's department. So it's more of a partnership, but um, it's, it's a teaching role, too. Without telling, it's a teaching role. You know, here's how we do it. Maybe you've got ideas to do it better. You know, if we're doing a leadership development program, it, going through the whole process, it's not easy to step into that role from out of nowhere. So what skills do you think are required to make a good leader in this, uh, not only women's the philanthropy? The biggest skills is you've got to turn around and make sure there's following you, somebody behind you, somebody That's following you. Uh, I, I believe more than, well, it is. If you don't have anybody behind you, you're not a leader. I think probably enthusiasm, dedication, and be able to instill that upon the people that are following you. Was women's philanthropy sort of the impetus for moving you, you know, through the system? Was that yes. was that a good first? Well, that yes, and that and getting involved in the overseas operations and the, and and uh, in a national level. Did that go? Was that concurrent with your involvement in women's philanthropy? Yes. I, well, it was even before I became um, involved in the national women's scene. Uh, I went to Israel. I went to Poland and Romania and um, Israel with Sylvia Hassenfeld in 1974. And I was. I maybe. I was maybe chairman of the big gifts division. I forget. It's, I got a metal block. Ruthie and I went, and I think that catapulted me to. We. I went with that year. I went the next year. Then I be, was asked to go on the National Women's Board. Then I was asked to start the Young Women's National Young Leadership Cabinet, and that all happened before I became camp, Women's Division Campaign Chairman. So, so you did all of those things, important things. Uh, were you able to translate and bring that back? What I learned on the... What you learned on yes, the... And yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, thing. I definitely think the fact that I had been to Poland and Romania and Israel, I had gone through, been there right after the, 70, uh, the, 70, the um, Yom Kippur War, I think that that gave me an opportunity to explain and I hope instill in everybody the feelings and what was going on um, in, an, in, a, in a world that we were, not everybody had seen at that stage of the game. So I thought, I think by my storytelling, I would hope that people got the, and I thought it was, I'm a pretty enthusiastic speaker, so I think that, because uh, I'm, you know, I believed in what I was talking about. Uh, and, and were you able to translate that beyond the women's philanthropy? Did uh, the general campaign make use of those skills? Yes. And what impact do you think that that had? And was it Jane Sherman related? Was it uh, someone coming from women's philanthropy related? Or 
a little uh, well, combination I, I of I think both. it was probably both. I think it was my expertise. I think that it was my leadership ability. I think it was the amount of stuff that I knew that others didn't know, where I had been in the world and what I had learned. Um, and I hope all those things led to, the gen led to some leadership in the general campaign. Do you think women solicit differently than men? Well, having okay. never said back then and even back then and now, um, I don't think I do. I think women are probably most women are probably a little bit more timid than I am. Still, I believe so. Yeah, I, I most women, I'm, I, I, they still don't. Uh, I feel that you know, you don't get if you don't ask, and I'm not scared to ask. But I don't know how many women, and I don't know how many women really ask, or they just pick up the phone and call. Them, Michael, I've got your card. Will you make a pledge today? You know, I'd rather call Michael Burke, I have your card, and would you raise your pledge $10,000? So I think that's a little bit more effective. I mean, not exactly like that, but if you don't, I don't believe if you don't ask, you don't get. It's true. I, I agree with you. Well, you taught me, too. Where does women's philanthropy fit into your, um, the lexicon of your skill set in terms of how important it was oh, to Oh, it was you? very important. It taught me everything that I know. Yeah. Or a lot of it. Uh, I don't know if it's women's department, women, national women's division, but all of it, which you don't have in a general campaign. You don't have that. That and the Young Leadership Cabinet, all those things, um, gave me the, the tools that I was able to use later in life. All right, so now I'm going to flip that. Mm -hmm. What did you teach us from your perspective as a leader in the community? And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on women's philanthropy because I know that you did and so I what did I teach women's philanthropy yeah. I how, how hope, did you as a I leader hope that, change uh, I th hope that I taught them that you have to really love what you're doing and really believe in the future of the Jewish people and that we had a responsibility to the future of the Jewish people and if I taught them that and sense of community which was very important. You can't just, it has to be the total community. It can't be the home for the aged or just the state of Israel. If we're going to keep this community going, um, the, the sense of community is very important. But I think the excitement and the, the knowledge I had about many of these things, I believe I instilled in the women that followed after me. Is it true still today that that's an important thing to do? But the community? Yes, it's more important today than it ever was, and we have a real issue with it. Well, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm interested uh, in uh, what you think the challenges the cha we're facing today, and how, you know, we oh. can talk about how the women can play a role in meeting those challenges, but I'm interested. I think it's, it, it's men or women. I think the biggest challenge we have today are two things with the younger generation. Number one, sense of community, um, and wanting to um, designate, and designation of giving. The, this generation, first of all, and then you've got the issue of the whether we should be supporting Israel against the fact that we're bad to the Palestinians. I mean, those issues for the many very liberal young Jews that are in college. So I think we have a threefold process to deal with. First of all, um, I think the one about Israel and the Palestinians is one of education. Uh, I've just dealt with it in, in Israel for the past three weeks. I think we have to teach our young people much, they have to be much better educated to be able to counteract what's going on on the campuses. Uh, and you probably know that as well as being president of Hillel. The other thing is that I believe that this generation, because maybe it's because Israel doesn't have the, uh, is not as important to their life, they should believe it's important to their lives, but they don't, that they don't have the same sense of community. But I think we have to teach them about community that's for all Jews. Everything has to be together. Everybody can't go out and make Shabbos themselves. And it's a very difficult process with this generation. And we have to start with them with their young, educate them properly. Some of the programs they've got going here, I think, are very the Grossfeld trip, the Emerging Leaders program, involving men and women, not just doing it for men, I think are very, very important to teach people here, teach people all over the country. Now, obviously, we come from a community that is much stronger than any place else in the United States. Maybe Cleveland's as strong community-wise. But still, you're hearing the young people talk about uh, how they want to designate their giving and not become involved. They don't want somebody else making their choice of where their money's going. Um, 
What do you think about that? I th what do I think about it? I, I happen not to agree with it. Uh, because? Because I feel that if everybody starts making Shabbos for themselves, we will not have a Jewish community that can support all the needs in the future, be it here or in Israel. It doesn't make any difference, or in Poland, or Hungary, or Germany, or Argentina, wherever you want to talk. I believe if everybody starts, so everybody next week decides they want to give for the home for the agent, and nobody wants to give to JVS, and nobody wants to give to Israel, what happens to the whole Jewish structure of a federation movement? Yeah. Uh, now, and I, and I think it's very important, and I think we have to teach them to understand that. Uh, do you think we're doing uh, an adequate job? I think that in at Detroit we are. I've been into a number of no other communities where they're not. Do you think women's philanthropy, that's a priority for them? Too? I don't know. You'll have to ask the chairman of the women's philanthropy. Oh, I can't answer that. Oh, I would hope it is. Um, I think they've shied away from, they are doing a leadership development program. I'm not involved enough in women's philanthropy to really give you the answers. Of what's so, you, so you really can't speak about how it's changed over the years? or not Maybe you have, not maybe in you have a ten. sense. Well, tell, me, in last tell me how it changed you know, over the course of when you started with them till you sort of lost well, they became uh, They became much more involved in campaign, but they became much more, you know, when they stopped calling cards at the, at the Lion of Judah, I mean, it drove me crazy. Even my daughter said, I went to this meeting and they didn't call cards. She was amazed. I, I mean, they get much more insulated. I would have fought the battle to keep calling cards. I still think it raises more money um, in this, you know, but they'd kill me if I did it. Did you have something to do with the creation of the Lion of Judah? I don't remember. No, I didn't want to bring the pin here, if you remember. Clark. No, I don't. That's what I'm I asking didn't, you. I didn't. And that's because? I didn't think we needed something to raise the money on. I mean, it's proved, I, listen, I was wrong. It's proved very, very successful. Uh -huh. But I don't like to put labels on things that, uh, you know, I, I'm a real, uh, what's the word I want? Purist. Purist. But it's raised billions of dollars. Right. And Lion of Judah is still an important part oh, of women's yeah. philanthropy. Oh, yes, a very it? important part. Has it grown? Yes. In term, I know it's grown in terms of dollars. Has it grown in terms of numbers, Jane? Oh, know? yes, yes. I'm, yes, I think even here it's grown in terms of numbers. Yeah. What, um, and maybe, maybe you don't know the answer to this question, but I'm curious. Uh, what's women's philanthropy's relationship to women's departments throughout the country and what role do you think we might play? Well, I don't think women's, I think that there's four or five people on the National Women's, whatever it's called, U, it's not UJA, National Women's Board. Um, I would hope that they play a role in, in learning from each other, but I don't see it the way it was in our day. Somebody got a program, a national program, like when Ruthie and I did the leadership development program, they were able to take it nationally and teach other people how to do it. I don't believe they do that today. I don't believe they take the, pro and that, that's one of the problems with JFNA. They're not utilizing the resources they have. I mean, here we've got, we had the Sherman Leadership Mission. There's two communities that followed up on it, only because Vicki Agron got on their backs. There are all sorts of programs, Grossfeld. How many other communities are doing Grossfeld? Nobody, because nobody has taken that program out, the Emerging Leaders Program. Uh, there's a pro program in Cleveland, and I just talked to Erica, the new um, president, the Cleveland president and CEO of the fair. They've got a fabulous program for helping um, uh, people in, in, in Cleveland. I said to Scott, why don't we take that, J I think it's called J-Help. Why don't we utilize this here? In other words, and there's no sharing of ideas like there was in our day. We used to have you know, regional meetings, they don't have well, that. that. that was what I they was They don't thinking. have that today. Now, I don't know if the, 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 big, the big 19 execs meet, they have meetings, but I don't think they share ideas. I think there's a lack of sharing of what's going on throughout the country. So there is no uh, women's president's interaction with other women's not that presidents? I'm, not that I know of. Yeah. I mean, there could be, but I surely haven't heard any uh -huh. yet. Um, Are women playing a more important role in how we do our business? Yes. I mean, they've obviously, we've got women 
you know, presidents, vice presidents sitting on the boards, chairing different agencies, et cetera, et cetera. Does a woman's philanthropy, in your opinion, is it still yes, it's, an important feeder? Yes, I still, it's not even so much a feeder. It is a feeder because you get better trained in the women's department than you do any place else. So I think the women are much better educated, understand things better, and know what to do easier than most men that come into the system. Um. Tell me about your, uh, th this, this is off script, but I want to I hear from you. Uh, you have strong feelings about support for Israel as opposed to oh, support for the community. Well, and I, and I, so I will bring it back to women's philanthropy. Okay. How, do they, how do they deal with that dynamic? And, you know, well, look, uh, there's different areas. I don't feel that Israel is, um, I think we have an overseas agenda that we have to take care of. Um, whether it's the former Soviet Union, or it's Berlin, or Argentina, or Israel. Um, I believe in Israel, we brought in all these immigrants, and we have a responsibility to make sure they're viable, productive citizens of the country. At the same time, I understand about the needs here. So, um, if you'd ask me this question 15 years ago, I'd say, a bigger, you know, we can't stop supporting Israel. I don't believe we can stop supporting Israel at any time, just because we need the relationship. But they're doing other things, by making, creating people-to-people -people relationships and, and um, trying to bring us closer to the Israeli population or the Israeli population closer to the diaspora Jews. And I think that's very important. At the same time, taking over the responsibilities that we have to do. Um, I don't know if the women's department pays any more role in it than the general campaign or the general campaign. Um, I was kind of disappointed when the Federation came out with this new thing at this meeting where they decided to cut the overseas allocation. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think quite as upset as Penny and Nancy were. I think it's a mistake. I think that, um, uh, I think if we don't have Israel at the other end, um, we're lost. I th that's how important I think it is. I think we need, and I think we have to teach our children and our grandchildren the same thing. Are we doing that? No, not, a, not as well as I'd like. Can the women's philanthropy play a role in that? I think teaching by getting our, more, I teaching think. Teaching our children well, so to speak. I think that, I think it's a, a, not just a woman's thing. I think we have to get people to Israel, teach them about the love of the state. That doesn't mean they have to give all billions of dollars but it's, it's a fact of having, and I think we have not created as much. Now, I had an, we had an interesting discussion, because I was at a birthright board meeting, too, with Len Sachs, who does all the um, uh, studies for birthright, and I had made the comment, I guess I made the comment at the Jewish Agency meeting, and it jumped on me, that I don't believe our young people are in touch with the state of it, much less in touch with the state of Israel. And he says, from all statistics he's brought, he said, we've brought 700,000 kids on birthright. He says, that, even though they're not all from the United States. And he said, they have now have a touch with Israel. I said, Len, you've got two million more you've got to get, get the same, same relationship to. So if we get them on birthright, I think that it's more not just the women's department. I think it's a general campaign, federation thing. On birthright, onward Israel, on Massab programs, uh, Jewish summer camps. These are the things that create, maintain our Jewishness, and, the, main their, and their love for the state of Israel is also their love for community. In your opinion, do, do you think women in the community have the same love for women's philanthropy as they did back in your time? Is it, you know, women's philanthropy was a pri uh, kind of a single focus priority. There are now many more opportunities for women. Um, you know, around the community. I'm just wondering what your sense is. I, of how we I've never thought about it, but you're probably right. I've never thought about it. Um, also, they have the opportunity to go into the general community where they, general campaign or general part of federation, where in my day and age it was a tough battle to get in there. So, um, I don't know if it's a lack of, and it's unfair for me to say because I'm so far away from it now. I mean, I attend the board meeting, I attend the, you know, I, but it's hard for me to say. I mean, I announce people at these meetings, I've never, they're like grandchildren of my friends, and I'm delighted to see them there. If they have the same sense of, um, what is the word I want? 
Commitment? That's not commitment. Yes, or many of them have the same passion. Sense of passion that we had. I don't know. And again, it, part of it has to do with the era we lived in, with all the, with all the catastrophes or wars and everything else. Do you think that um, Israel is still the best common denominator for philanthropy? And if that's true, are the women taking advantage of Israel? I don't think, I don't think they're taking advantage of it. I do believe it's one of the one of the best. Yes, I think it's the best common denominator. It's not the only one. I think you have to talk about a federation that's, you know, for everybody, and I think that keeping a um, centralized system um, is very very important. I don't know if Israel is the only one any anymore, but I I don't believe that anybody in this community is doing the role that I think they should be with involving the state of Israel. Or forget the state of Israel. Let's talk about Berlin or Argentina or, or um, any of the countries that we take care of Jews. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's important to maintain a women's philanthropy department? Yes. Why? Because I believe they're the educators in the homes. That's a good answer. And what are your hopes? What would you have done if I'd said no? They <laughs> wouldn't put would this have, recording up. I would have listened to you. I mean, you know, but that was a good answer. Um, why, is, why is philanthropy important to you, personally? Why is philanthropy important to me? I believe I should give back. I have never thought about it. Why is it important? It's part of my life. I want to do it. I think that I want to um, be able to see things, be able to provide things for people that otherwise can't have them. No matter who it is, you know, or what it is. Uh, I want to be, I guess that's why philanthropy is important. And you get a lot more out of it than you're giving away, I have to tell you. I agree with you. What are your hopes for the women's philanthropy for the future? What are your hopes for the Federation for the future? Uh, you know, you and I may not be here 30 years from now. Oh, you don't think so? Well, you never know. But I'm, I'm you know, if we, if, we woke, if we woke up 25 years from now, what would you like to see Women's Philanthropy and Federation Okay, look like? first of all, I'd like to see Women's Philanthropy strong as it is today, if not stronger. Because as I said before, I believe that that's they're the way, they still are the educators in the home, and I believe for no other reason than getting across to younger children to being involved in their Jewish life. I think it comes from the woman. Um, for Federation, I would hope it would be as strong as it is today, if not even stronger, because we have many needs in, this, in, the, in the Jewish community here as well as abroad. Um, whether you're gonna, and if we don't continue that, who's gonna send the kids to Jewish day school or to camp or to take care of the, in the apartment, in the Fleischmann apartments? All the needs the Jews that cannot afford it will not have an opportunity to have if we don't have a strong Federation. What's your sense of, um, our, our, um, I want to phrase this the right way, I'll let you go in a second. Mm -hmm. um, what's your sense of uh, the vitality of the Detroit community and the vitality of women's department as we move forward? Are you, are you optimistic about who and what we are? Or no, I'm very optimistic. First of all, the vitality of our federation is so far above any in the country that it's, that, um, that I believe that uh, it's going to be here and it'd be very, very strong. And I would hope the women's department would have the same vital vitality. Good. Anything else you want to talk about? I want to ask about your kids. You want to talk about my kids? Yeah, what's going on okay. with your kids? Well, first of all, first of all, you know, I have three great-grandchildren. One is, I was, t who was I telling? Oh, I just ran into Daron Levine. I said, you tell Levine she's got to stay there, teach first grade four more years when Bo becomes first grader at at Hillo, because he's in the preschool. And um, they're all back here, all my grandchildren are back here now. So it makes it, those that are in college. So. Uh, uh, Still Shabbat dinners at your house? Every Friday night, every Friday night. Yeah. Whoever shows up, shows up. And uh, the kids with the little babies have to leave because you know they're on this tie, I don't know with Mark. But well, Mark's kids are too big. But I mean, my grandchildren, if they don't get to bed at a quarter to seven, their children get to bed at a quarter to seven, the world's going to fall apart. They have to leave the table at 6.30 to get, well, at least my one daughter, granddaughter-in-law. So it's, they don't last quite as long.
And what about your boys and girls, your, okay. your sons and daughters? Well, Sylvia, you know, is living by me. She's divorced, and she lives by me. She is she involved at all in the Federation? Yeah, she's on the women's... Uh, She's on the women's board. She's on the okay. IOC. She goes to Fenlo. I think her year's up. She doesn't know it yet, but I heard that yesterday from Bob Hertzberg. She's on the IOC. She's very involved in ORD and book fair. Very involved. Book fair? So not book fair. Um, book stock. Yeah. Um, and David is, David is um, involved in Yad Ezra. He's doing this J, um, what's this new thing they're doing? The pro, there's a whole new thing. Jay, they're, where they're putting everything on an app. Anyway, he's he's been involved in starting that. They've got Montreal involved, and Scott is. The, Scott said after this trip, we just took the entire Fisher Foundation, all the kids, the grandchildren, and Scott said after this trip, he says I'm going to come back. He's going to get involved in the Fisher Foundation on one of their committees, which is very good. His wife, Robbie, you know, she was president of Michigan Art. She's she's now very involved in the My women's former department. Neighbor. Yeah, she's very she's very involved in the women's department. And <clears throat> my grand Andrew is emerging part of my grandchildren are involved too. Emerging leader, Brett and Dakota are now getting involved, so it's it's exciting. So it's what you what you said that the women are the educators and they're the well, continuity. I, I hope so. But I suspect Larry has a little role in yeah, that too. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? Anything well, else? Well, we can talk about a lot of things, but you can turn off the tape. No, it's, it's just really, yeah, related to women's philanthropy. No, I can't tell you anything yeah. about women's Well, I want to thank you on behalf of the women's department for coming in and uh, spending a little time. And personally, I want to thank I, you. I love it that you did the interview. Yeah. That was exciting. You've been doing these? Yeah. Who else did you do? I thought you just wanted to do you me. You can turn it off.